I know that this is not necessarily a true story, but it is based on your personal experiences working at a short-term home. Uh, can you talk a little bit about when, what about your experience there you really wanted to convey, and when in the process, was it as soon as you left the job there that you knew you needed to make a movie about this? No, when I, when I was working there, I, I wasn't really able to think beyond that day and trying to survive that day and trying to survive that week and um, trying to get over the fact that I was constantly terrified and constantly wanting to quit but um uh over the over the course of those two years it was uh it was you know it was a, it was a very impacting experience for me and and it stuck with me all the way through college it was like or through my my um master's program in film and so it was about three years later when i had the assignment of doing doing a thesis film um, I went, th I went back through my old journals that I had written during my time when I was working there, and uh, I, th I think enough time had passed at that point that I was able to organize some of those thoughts into a story, which which was a short film initially. Um, that was my thesis, and then later that that transformed into the feature. When you went to transform the short, did you sort of just? knock it all over and start from scratch or did you organically sort of build it from there with the similar characters i i had to knock it over um because i i initially tried to to expand it from the short film and use all the same characters but um it it didn't feel it ju it just felt boring like it felt like i was redoing the the same thing and um, and that short wasn't initially meant to be turned into a, a feature. So um, so uh, as soon as I changed the main character from a, a male to a, a female protagonist, everything kind of, uh, I mean, uh, the whole world changed. Mm. Cool socks, by the way. Uh, Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I remembered that I was going to be, you know, doing anything in public today when uh, I put I these on. I love those socks. <laughs> but, uh, um, <laughs> So now, a <laughs> question for Ms. Larson. Uh, I think it's sort of an obvious question, but one well worth asking because the performances are so, there's such an intimacy that's fostered between you and the other characters. Uh, and it, it seems so lived in that entire performance. And so I guess I'm just wondering what sort of preparation you did, who you may have spoken with beforehand to really get into that world. Um, yeah, uh, there's, a few, there's a few different aspects that needed to be understood and explored before we started shooting. Um, one is all of the subtext that's throughout the film, which is a lot fueled by her past. So I had to think about that, create that, which involved also sitting down with John and and we went to dinner and, and um, Dustin gave us these little conversation starters, which got us talking about uh, our childhoods and fears of being a parent and then specifics about our relationship. And um, and then the other aspect of it was was her job, and uh, I shadowed at a facility, as well as just kind of openly spoke with some people that uh, have Grace's job, and then sat down with each one of the kids and talked with them a little bit about what information I would know about them um, to understand better how Grace would relate with them, how she would, what her expectations were of each one of them, and their sensitivities, and all of those combined, and then Norwegian black metal to be able to listen to before starting each scene kind of informed the whole thing. No age, is that what we said? No, Norwegian no, black metal. Ah, uh, I see. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> no age would also have made sense. No age would be cool. <laughs> uh, and a question for both of the actors here. Uh, there's such a performative quality about the, the job as it's required, not as actors, but you know, to work as counselors here. I think they, um, as it's seen very clearly in the movie, have to put on masks to go to work every day. And Rami's character is sort of... Uh, without the mask, hasn't built that mask for himself yet. And so I, as actors, was that something that helped you get into the role, sort of understanding what that's like to always feel like you're performing? Hmm. Hmm. What a great observation. It's, it's the socks. Well, it's I think the, for my character, it's, it's, it's th that is almost maybe slightly more obvious because he uses humor uh, as a kind of a tactic, uh, a way to distract and deflect and comfort um, the kids. Um, in a way that I think 
it, it was kind of fascinating because it's the idea of you know how how can you be like a really good friend to these kids but also also stay a disciplinarian and, and stay trustworthy and there's something about coming to their level and kind of you know goofing around with them and joking around with them that disarms them in a way but then also you know the tables turn and you can you, you can you can you then have their trust in a way so that when it comes time to crack the whip a little bit if you need to raise your voice or, or restrain someone that's 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 freaking out um you're able to kind of do that little balancing act and um that was something that i i shadowed at the same facility that Bree did and that was something that i saw that was very prevalent there was was um keeping things light um, um, not in a, in a way that's disrespectful, but just kind of joking and keeping kind of a light air throughout the day to try and just get it through the get through the day without um, you know any 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 tantrums or anything. I think it was really cool that you bring that up because we, I was just talking about um, this earlier today. Uh, one one of my supervisors um, was was a female who when I I when I talked to her hung out with her outside of the walls of that place she was she was a very she had a very small frame um and she, her voice was very quiet she was some kind of shy shy personality and um when she went through the gates to to be a supervisor for this place i could i could literally see her you know stand outside and take a breath and put on this thing this personality this somewhat fictional but it, you know it, it is a part of her but she she puts on this this uh this armor and she was she walks she, when she would walk into that that place she was a she was a badass and she, and the kids respected her she respected them and and she was a really incredible uh supervisor and a, a wonderful person to work for so that was, that was a cool observation yeah, I mean, uh, especially uh, in context of Grace's character and that badassness. I mean, after a long summer of superheroes, it's nice to to see <laughs> to see something a little bit more relatable in that vein. <laughs> Real superheroes, exactly. Um, and I mean, to that end, there were there any points because there's a certain social responsibility that you guys may have felt um, while making this that you wanted to represent these kids in a way that was honest and accurate and and maybe help them to people in their situations realize that family is a fluid idea and that there's always a chance to, to have one. And I wonder, was there any point in crafting the drama and, and attending to the needs of every scene that you felt that what you wanted to do as a writer or as an actor uh, interfered with, I don't know, a greater responsibility to telling this accurately? Huh. All these interesting questions. <laughs> uh, I think that's... It wasn't necessarily specifically about the 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 social issue of it, but... Any time I've found that I'm I'm playing a character, and especially someone that you spend a lot of time with, like I had to with Grace, and and you're playing somebody who's really struggling, you so badly at certain points want to do, you want to be above them and kind of help them and do what what I would want her to do, but not what she actually does, and it becomes painful as the vessel of her to continue to throw yourself into a situation knowing that it's going to be painful, knowing that it's counterproductive to what is actually good for them because you care about them and love them. Um, and there's been many times where I've, I, one, not during this film, but another film in particular where I remember arguing for a very long time with a director about... Uh, the ending, like my character's final scene and the outcome of it. And I argued for a long time and he finally said, you have to let this go. This has nothing to do with you. You can't do what she wants. You can't do what you want for her. It has to be what she wants. It's, like, oh. it's hard because you're playing somebody and you're inside them, but then you're also have this weird perspective of being almost outside of my body and away from this character. And it's, so important and and it's a strange balance to play to um to just allow it to be what she would what she's going to be doing uh mr gallagher not to typecast you as a nice guy but i think they're certainly the roles i've seen you in recently have genuinely been decent human beings uh which is rare is some defined in movies <laughs> often um is is there a unique challenge to playing someone who is just fundamentally decent who is not you know dealing with uh more dramatic and 
Yeah, the, I think the challenge is to um, make sure that that stays believable, because um, I think it's 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 kind of hard to convince an audience that there are saints in the world nowadays. It's like kind of tough, and especially in a small, intimate movie that very much is about real people, it can be very easy to be like, uh, the, uh, "Come on, he would have like he would have left the relationship by now. He would have been out of there. He would, you know." Um, or I don't I don't know if people are thinking that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> like, she's a pain in the oh ass. Oh my god, I Get can't him. believe he's he saying, should be running he for the so patient um <laughs> but uh because at a certain point it, i think that can start to almost become kind of unrealistic in a way um and but destin took care of that challenge for me by by the the beautiful reveal in the last half of the film that you actually see that this person is a grown-up product of the foster care system working uh for someone and so you see why that character is selfless in that way because he almost did not have a family and is with this person that he knows needs one and he wants to provide that and so that um that in this case made it um made it a kind of easy to uh, to live inside that and it's always it's just it feels good to be nice and i wish that i was as i wish i was as selfless and good as as the character in the film but it's a uh, um you know destin created such a nice atmosphere on the on the on the on set and working with those with those kids it was it was not problem it was not a problem being nice to them because they're just the best mm -hmm. And the last time I spoke with Destin, we talked a little bit about how Rami's character, Nate, was sort of his proxy. Uh, and I'm wondering, for you guys, how much, uh, how much you saw of Destin in that character, if, uh, if, <laughs> sort of, if Nate's sort of innocence or whatnot, if his sense of humor was, I don't know, how, how close it cleaved to your director. <laughs> I, I see a little bit of Destin and everybody in it. I mean, just kind of the tone of it and the 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 dry sense of humor uh, and the subtlety of it. And the thing that I personally just gained from working with him was the ability to be. Um, and it's something that I don't, I mean, maybe people do say this to you all the time and don't get a big head about it, but it, that he he's not trying to prove anything you fit you just it's very easy to he's very very easy to be around and um and very non-judgmental and i think the film is unbiased and and non-judgmental uh, and i guess i'll ask one more question before we open it up to to the floor but uh there's some great bike riding scenes in this movie uh and i think you know there's a long tradition in, in the cinema of of bikes in movies, but you are one of the great bike riding actresses, I think, <laughs> prove in this film. Would you agree with that? I would think, <laughs> totally. I would think not. <laughs> I think there's some bike riding that got cut out because I wasn't very good at it. There were, there were a few that got cut out because <laughs> Brie wasn't very good at going, uh, she was really no, good at going I downhill. Good at going uphill, but we found out later but that it was, it was a on bad a bad bike. Yeah, it was on a bad Always gear. blame the bike. It was, it was a bad bike. I'm pretty in shape. There's no... I saw a bike. That's not I'm what I'm saying. Bike. I think the seat was too low, so then your knees were coming up too high. You, know. you sell. It's very expressive. I really... F I'm in your character's head when you're on that bike. Um, so, well done. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Um, the do I need to repeat the question? Uh, the so the question was about the casting process for the kids and then the rehearsal process for everybody. The the casting process for the kids was was fairly traditional um, in that you know I sat in a room and and uh, f stressed out and freaked out for uh, three weeks thinking how impossible this task is going to be because it, it, it was impossible. I, it, was, it was very difficult to find what we needed in the short period of time that we had. And some by some miracle in every every occasion on every single character, at some point somebody came in and made me um, did something in that performance that made me forget I had written those lines and made me forget even that I was in a little room um, watching a, a, an audition. And they moved me, made me laugh, made me cry. And, and there, was, there was always like just one miracle that walked in. Um, 
Caitlin, Caitlin Deaver came in and when she left, I was just like, I didn't even say bye. It was a little awkward because I was just crying and she, her team, her, her scene was also just a very <laughs> emotional scene. So we were both crying and then she just said, okay. And then she was, okay, bye. And she left. Um, and that, you know, a version of that happened with everybody and thank goodness that their schedules worked out because there was no option two for any character, you know? Um, so, so that's how the casting process went. The, uh, the rehearsal process was, was less about rehearsing scenes, um, and more about really getting to know each other and build relationships. And we, we had, we had one day. Um, and so it was, we all got together and we, we had some food and then we, we sat around in a circle and um, I had my, my friend Kevin who works at a place very similar to this and has been doing it for, for I think f 15 years or so. He, um, he came up and everyone was, was able to ask him questions, tell him, uh, the, all the kids were able to tell him about their, the characters they're playing and explain kind of their backstory. And he um, then related to them other stories that that kind of um, that they could pull from of real kids that he knew and stories that he knew, um, and 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 then John played. Uh, we we did our first attempt at playing that game Big Booty, which was horrible, but really fun. And I think what it did was was allowed the the kid act or all of our our kids who um, who it allowed them to see. John and Bree be silly and allowed them to to see that it's okay to be silly, you know, which is huge for this for this film and and huge for I think creating this environment that is uh, very safe and free. So, um, yeah, thank goodness for all those things somehow lining up in this in this small project with a very short window of prep. <laughs> a question that I have to ask on behalf of everyone I've spoken to about the film. Uh, did you work at short-term number 12, or did you just like the alliteration for the title? <laughs> um, it, it's actually... Very uh, important. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily the name of the place that I worked at, but it's a, it's, um, there was a short-term 12 at the place that I worked at. It's, and there are short-term 12s at other places. Um, it's a it's a fairly common. There there are short-term facilities, long-term facilities within within each group home, um, and the number refers to kind of the the level of care that the the kids need. And so 14 is the highest. 12 in in the in the system that I am familiar with, 14 was the highest, and 12 was the next level down, and it kind of keeps going down from there. So there's also a, a, a long-term 12 and a long-term 14 and a mm. short-term 14. Uh, and I was also wondering if you could talk a little bit about the music. I mean, the movie, um, sort of, the, there's a beautiful soundtrack, and it sort of sneaks up on you because it's not especially intrusive. But I think uh, walking away from the movie, you sort of hear it resonating in your head, or at least I did. Uh, so I'm curious as to how that became part of the process, how closely you worked with the uh, musician and when you were writing the scripts or or when you were on set if you knew exactly what sort of tones you wanted the, the score to have um joel p west is a a friend of mine who i was actually a fan of his music before we started work before we became friends and started working together and so uh he's he's just a, a wonderful person to create stuff with he's and and he he came on set. Um, we, he didn't really start composing until we we began editing. But he did come on set a couple of times to to feel what it was like to to be in the room with um, while we were shooting some of these more intimate scenes. And um, and I think he took that uh, that sense of quiet back with him. And uh, and the ideas of of having a score um, trickle in as opposed to slap you in the face was was something that we wanted from the beginning and I don't know Joel, Joel I think just his, his instincts are he just 
writes really beautiful things that I love listening to and I would love to put on in my car and just and it's his music has always been whether it's his band the tree ring that he plays in or or scores that he's done with me his music has always um it, it's always put pictures into my brain and so it, it's a it's a really it's it's kind of a, a really nice nice thing thing to add into the movie do you still listen to it independently do you put on the vinyl oh yeah i do if you i don't have a, there's no vinyl yet but but the the soundtrack actually i think is being released next tuesday or something you can find it on itunes and pre-order it but and listen to some of the, some of the tracks it's really beautiful and have you screened the film or uh, for any kids who um i don't know what the circumstances would be like but uh for more direct feedback um you you mean kids in the system? Sure. Yeah, there there's a, um, I mean we we have not taken the film to an actual foster care facility just because it's you know it's a rated R movie, um, but we've had, uh, I've I've had on a number of occasions at at festivals. Um, I mean, the second festival we played at, I had a kid come up to me. He was he was twenty, and he said he he's. He was aged out of the system uh, two years earlier, and he had been living in a in a facility r- really similar to this one his whole teenage life. And and I, when he said that, I was like, "Oh crap! Here comes the uh, you you suck at making movies." Comment. And he he was just very thankful, and and he he said he he came he came in ready to to hate hate the movie you know and he he was i mean thank god that he was that he was very moved and touched and and thankful that we had done something that that um at, at least represents uh enough of his experience to, that he was able to, to to identify with the movie so that was very special for me well i think that's all the time we have but thank you guys so much for coming and talking about the film. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. It'll be out next Friday, so tell your friends. Go see it again.